Okay, good. Okay, so um, uh, I want to talk about two things today. So I want to start by talking about uh, Pereshki's theorem on the syzygies of abelian varieties. And then I'll talk about uh, curves of large degree. And at the very end, I'll mention uh, the canonical curve. So, uh, so the first topic is Beppe Pereshki's theorem. Okay. So I stated this at the end of last lecture. So let me kind of recall what the statement is. So his theorem is uh, uh, it's the generalization of classical work of various people on the equations defining abelian variety. So x is an abelian variety of, well, it doesn't exactly mention, uh, so abelian variety. It doesn't exactly matter what the dimension is, but let's say the dimension is n. And uh, a is an ample line bundle on x. And so I remind you that the way the classical theorems work, um, you know, for example, one of the classical theorems of Lefschetz is that if you take twice an ample line bundle, that's always globally generated. Three times an ample line bundle is very ample, and so on. So you look at multiples of A, and you want to understand the, the equations defining the corresponding embedding. And so then, uh, uh, as I stated last time, his theorem is that if we take L equal to K plus 3 times A, then uh, this satisfies this property, n sub k. So remember, n sub 0 means it defines a projectively normal embedding. n sub 1 means that uh, under this embedding, well, first of all, it's projectively normal. And n sub 1 means that then the ideal of the variety is uh, cut up by quadrics. n sub 2 would mean that the, co the coefficients of the syzygies among quadrics are generated by relations with uh, degree one coefficients and so on. And then the other thing we saw at the end of last time was that this is, I mean, if you take x to be an elliptic curve, then this is what comes out of Green's theorem. So it's kind of the, the natural adjunction of this. So the theorem itself is actually, it's not a completely soft romp from the park to prove it. But I want to give you kind of a very vague idea of the proof in the first non-trivial case, just so you see some of the ingredients. And, uh, so vague idea of the proof, Pereshki's proof, in the case uh, in the case k equal 1. So actually, in this case, the theorem had been proven shortly before Pereshki by uh, Kempf. So we want to say that 4 times a very ample line bundle defines an embedding under which the thing is cut up by quadrics. OK. And uh, I'm going to be sufficiently vague that it's not going to be completely clear where the numbers come from, but hopefully you'll get some sense. OK. So we want to say, uh, so we'll let uh, L be four times a very ample thing, four times an ample thing. And we want to say that, uh, and we want to prove, we want to prove that this uh, satisfies this property N1. So, okay. Okay, now remember last time um, we saw that the syzygies of, uh, are, are governed by some big vector bundle on X. So in this case, it's what we call M sub L. So let's recall this m sub l. So recall that we had this vector bundle. If we have a very ample line bundle or globally generated line bundle, we can cook up a big vector bundle m sub l on our variety. And it's defined by an exact sequence like this. So we take the sections of l, and we form the trivial vector bundle with those fibers. And then we can uh, evaluate them. So this is a surjective vector bundle map. And then m sub l is the kernel. So this is defining this this vector bundle m sub l. And notice that in our situation, this has huge rank, right? Because if you take four times an ample line bundle, it's what? It's like, uh, it's like 4 to the 2g or 4 to the g. It has lots of sections. So this is a very big rank vector bundle. And uh, remember what governs the, if you want to show that something is generated by quadrics, uh, what you need to show in terms of this vector bundle, to say that the ideal is generated by quadrics, what we need, as we saw last time, is a vanishing that looks like this. H1 of wedge 2 ML tensor L should be 0. So that's the vanishing that we're aiming for. So it's a little bit scary, because it's wedge 2 of some incredibly large rank vector bundle. 
Okay, and what we I mean, there's going to be an, in, I mean, the proof is going to involve an induction on K. So we can assume that we already understand anything we want about N sub zero. So in particular, we'll assume we already know, uh, we already know that this N sub zero is okay. Uh, and what that means in terms of these vector bundles is we'll have a, we can assume that we already are happy about the vanishing of twist of M itself. So we don't know the which two, but we're good with the twist of M. And in fact, you need to actually along the way get a little bit more. So for example, we'll need, in fact, uh, leading up to this, one would need to know something like ML tensor three times A. So L tensor A dual and so on. So you have to, I mean, there's a an induction going on. But in any event, you can assume that you control the vanishing of twists of M. And the problem then is to, is to extend, is to sort of control the twists of uh, wedge two of M. Okay. Now, so Pereshti's first idea is to reduce the question to a surjectivity statement for a map of global sections of vector bundles. So I want to claim that it's, uh, it's enough to show the following. So what I want to claim is that to prove the thing we're interested in, I'll call this, it's enough to study this multiplication map. So we take sections of ML tensor L, tensor H naught of L, and these map to sections of uh, ML tensor L squared, and I claim that it's enough to know that these multiplication maps are surjective. So in other words, we're going to reduce, Piresh is going to reduce this to a statement about global multiplication of global sections of some vector bundle. And why is this? So, uh, so the proof of this claim is that if you, so let's grant that this star, so grant that this, these maps are surjective. Okay, well, what does that mean? If you take this sequence, this sequence there, and you twist it by um, ML tensor L, then uh, when you twist it by ML tensor L, on the right you get, and take global sections, you get H naught of L tensor H naught of ML tensor L mapping on to H naught of ML tensor L squared. So the H1 of the kernel will vanish. So if we, if we know this, then if we take this thing and we tensor by ML, tensor L, what we see is that this surjectivity here implies that uh, H1 of ML tensor ML tensor L is zero. So the idea is that sur surjectivity of multiplication by L is always governed by a, <laughs> a thing involving you throw in one more ML. But of course, well, we're in characteristic non-2, so this implies that the wedge 2 we're interested in is the sum end of this. So this implies that H1 of wedge 2 ML tensor L is 0, and that's what we want. OK, good. So what we've done is, uh, what uh, Pereshti's done, is he's reduced the question to a surjectivity statement for a, a map involving a multiple, multiplication of sections where you have a vector sections of a vector bundle, text tensor sections of a line bundle map to the sections of the vector bundle tensor of the line bundle. Okay, so let's now, uh, so let's sort of look at this in a slightly general situation for a moment. So let's uh, consider on this Abelian variety a vector bundle E, an ample line bundle L, And there have to be some vanishings to make things kind of look good. So, uh, H not HI of E tensor L tensor alpha. All these higher cohomologies should vanish for I of positive zero and I positive and all alpha in pick naught. So let's say we're in this uh, situation here. Now in the application, you see E is going to be this ML tensor. E is going to be this ML tensor L. And we control this kind of vanishing because those are governed by the case k equals 0. So any kind of vanishing that just involves an ML itself, we're OK with. What we need to do is pass to this sort of basically second tensor power of ML. So this is no problem in our setting. And so what Pereshki does is he defines what he calls a skew Pontryagin product. So uh, L pont skew, the, I think the hat means skew. So remember, the way you define the Pontryagin product 
of two vector bundles on the Boolean variety is you go to x cross x, you pull up the one, you pull up the other, and then you push it forward under addition. And uh, so this is going to be that you do the same thing, but you push forward under subtraction. So this was going to be d times d lower star times uh, p1 upper star of L tensor p2 upper star of E, where uh, so d, we, we're going from x cross x to x, and this is the subtraction map, difference map. Okay, so we take the, we pass to x cross x, we pull up the one thing, we pull up the other thing, take the exterior product, and then push it forward under subtraction. So this is what he calls the skew Pontryagin product. And now, this is, uh, because we have this kind of vanishing here, by Grauert's theorem, this is going to be a vector bundle, a huge rank vector bundle on x, uh, whose fiber at a point z, at a point z in x, so this is now, we're pushing for it to x. So this is some vector bundle on x. And if you think about it, if I've got my numbers right, it's fiber at, at x is canonically. So basically, I'm taking the pro it's h naught of the product of these two things, but there's a translate. So it's h naught of I pull the L factor back under translation by z tensor e. So for each z and x, I can pull L back by z, I tensor that by e, I get some new vector bundle on x. This has some global sections. This is a vector space. And this vector space is canonically the fiber of that thing there. So in other words, what this skew Pontryagin product does is it puts all these h naughts together in a vector bundle. So and, um, it, for the given point x, when I, uh, I'm sort of taking the fixed e, and I'm, trans I'm tensoring by a translator bound. OK. And now, um, OK, so let me. No, I'm, assu I'm doing the case k equals 1, because that's the first. So I'm assuming. What? No, I'm a, I mean, this is the, the proof is an induction. So I'm going to assume we've already done the case k equals 1, k equals 0. I'm going to show you how to do k equals 1. So I'm assuming, I mean, I mean, of course, it's an induction. So I'm going to assume we already know this kind of thing. So of course, you've got to do that, although I think it was basically known before. So I'm trying to explain what the kind of the interest, the new point in the proof is. So I'm assuming we know any, basically what I'm assuming is that we've already gone far enough in the proof we know anything about cohomology of M itself. And what we have to worry about is proving something about basically two-fold tensor products of M. And I'm not going to, I mean, <laughs> I'm not actually going to prove anything, but I'm going to explain what the, uh, this is, I think, the place where you kind of see what the, the idea is. So, uh, how you, okay, let's see. Okay. So, as I say, I, I'm just trying to give you the flavor. Uh, it's a non trivial proof, so I'm not going to. OK, so uh, where are we so far? So we've, we're assuming we control the first tensor, you know, cohomology of M tensor, whatever we like, any line bundle. We're trying to get these twofold tensor products. And um, uh, he's, so he's reduced the, the syzygy question to a surjectivity of these multiplication maps. And now to study these multiplication maps, he's introducing this skew symmetric, this skew, skew Pontryagin product. So if we have a vector bundle, a line bundle E, and a vector bundle L, we do this thing here. And we get this, uh, this big vector bundle L, skew, L star E, which is then a, a vector bundle on X whose fiber is this space of sections. And now the point is that um, uh, one sees, right, more or less from the definition, uh, one has the sections of this funny, uh, the space of global sections of, on X of this funny uh, Pontryagin product. So this is just the space of sections of L of, um, I'm sorry, this is just the tensor product of H naught of L 
the tensor H naught of E. Right, this is clear because you compute global sections before you push forward under the difference. And now if you have any vector bundle and you look at, you can evaluate the sections at a point and the evaluation map The, ma the evaluation map, uh, so anytime you have a, anything, you can take the global sections and you can evaluate it. So, uh, so if we take these sections and we evaluate them at the point Z, so this is a vector bundle, and we look at what happened to those sections at the point Z, what we get is, so is identified with, uh, so what, with, uh, so the space of sections is H naught of L tensor H naught of E. Maybe I'll write these maps uh, vertically. Uh, and then this, by translation, is isomorphic to H naught of T Z star L tensor H naught of E. And these multiply to give sections of H naught of T Z star L tensor E. So what's the upshot of this? I've written down, or he's written down, some huge vector bundle on a billion variety. And we know what the sections of that vector bundle are. And if we evaluate the sections at a point Z, then what we're doing is we're breaking H naught of, I mean, we're really looking at the multiplication map from H naught of the translate of L tensor H naught of E to H naught of L tensor E. Now remember, what we're interested in the question we're basically interested in is when are these, you know, when is this kind of map surjective? I mean, and so the point is what that is now equivalent to is that's equivalent to this funny vector bundle being globally generated at a point. So um, let me, so, so, so the upshot of this discussion is if uh, one proves that, that uh, this vector bundle L, uh, star E is globally generated, uh, then, then it follows that the maps H naught of TZ uh, tr star L tensor H naught of E, these multiplication maps on global sections are surjective. For all z, so it's rejective. For all z. Okay, so this is a sort of a general discussion here. So if you want to sort of study these multiplication maps, you look at this skew Pontryagin product, and then you're reduced to showing that this funny vector bundle is globally generated, or at least that's a geometric statement. So, uh, so in other words, so. We're reduced to proving in our situation with these uh, m's. So what we're reduced to proving then is, so what we have to do is we have this L, that's our line bundle, skew tensor, skew Pontryagin product, ML tensor L. So this is some crazy vector bundle on X and reduced to proving that this vector bundle is globally generated. Well, you see, again, I haven't said that. I'm sort of giving a very vague introduction. But you see, this, so E is going to be basically ML tensor L. And the vanishing of HI of ML tensor L is N0. Those are, you know, multiplication maps. Of, I mean, that's the case. So by induction, we control any vanishing of cohomology of ML tensor L and its twists. Yeah, there's an induction. So you have to do the case K equals 0 first. And I'm so... The, the picture here is I'm assuming we, all, we understand anything we want about cohomology of ML tensor L tensor. Yeah, anything like that. That's fine. But the problem is then how do you go to weight two tensors in M? And then, you know, of course, the next step you'd go from, see, we're going to control these things here. Then we'd go to weight three tensors and so on and so forth. So any vanishing that just involves a cohomology of one ML we're good with by induction. I mean, of course, you need to keep track of it and find a good inductive statement. But this kind of thing we can assume we already know. 
Um, but so in our situation, to pass from one copy of ML to sort of a weight two tensor, what we do is we form this skew pontryatin prog, and we've got to sort of show that this vector bundle is globally generated. So now what we've, I mean, what, what, uh, what Presky's done is he's at least somehow reduced it to a, so the good news, he's reduced it to a, a geometric statement that some vector bundle is globally generated. The bad news is that it's a slightly scary vector bundle because you start with this big ML, and then you do this skew Pontryagin product, and you get some huge vector bundle, and that's the thing that you need to show is globally generated. But at least it's down to a, to a geometry problem. What? Another paper? Uh, probably. But that doesn't help you on a higher dimensional variety. That doesn't help you with H1. I mean, we're on an abelian variety. OK. Yeah, I would assume, I don't know. I mean, I assume they're stable. But these, these bundles have a tendency to be stable. But I'm not sure it's. Uh, Like on, um, okay, so now there's a, how do you show that this bundle is globally generated? So there's a nice, um, criterion of Kempf, so I guess this is step what? It seems to be step three. So, uh, so here's Kempf's criterion for uh, when a vector bundle is globally generated. So uh, you consider, let's consider, again, there's some vanishings we need to worry about, but it's not. So we consider, uh, well, let me call it F. So, because uh, F is going to play the role of this vector bundle there. So consider F a vector bundle on the Boolean variety X, A an ample line bundle. And I want to assume that, uh, so this is the assumption. Uh, well, okay, yeah, so this is the assumption that uh, the higher cohomology, it's a, let's see, it's a basically free A Mukai sort of thing. F tensor A dual tensor alpha should be zero for all for positive i and um, and all alpha and pick naught. So it's kind of like a, I mean, this grew into the theory of regularity. It's kind of like a regularity uh, statement. You want a negative twist of f to have vanishing higher cohomology, and um, uh, then with all twists by pick naught. So this is the assumption. And then Kemp's lemma is that then F is globally generated. So this is, again, a nice argument that basically uses you know, free Mukai transforms. In fact. Okay. But we'll just grant that this is true. So this is a general fact. OK, so where are we now? <laughs> so we want to apply this criterion to this crazy vector bundle. OK, so what we need to show so, uh, so need to show, to apply this, so we need to control the cohomology of this thing with negative twists. So we need to show that uh, HI of this crazy skew L, let's see, I want to, let me, I'm going to need more parentheses here. So, let me put it. so L tensor, ML tensor, uh, L Pontryagin ML tensor L. So this is now some crazy vector bundle on X. Tensor A dual tensor alpha is the higher cohomology of these things vanish for all positive i. OK. So <coughs> this is, again, there's kind of, um, let's see. Well, I'll put some more things here. Have I? OK, so there's kind of good news and bad news. So now we're down to kind of a single set of vanishings. But the scary thing is still that we've got this you know, funny Pontryagin problem with this great big vector bundle. And this is still pretty scary. But now the final step is that, uh, again, this is if you are, uh, 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 
if you remember how this sort of standard Fourier transform goes, if you, the Fourier transform, the fourier mukai transform takes a Pontryagin product into tensor product. You can exchange Pontryagin and tensor product. So there's an exchange property here that lets you that this is equivalent to showing so that the HI, so this thing here, there's some vanishings you need for this, but again, we control them. So this crazy HI here is isomorphic so we can interchange the, the M and the A here. So the, this is isomorphic to the cohomology of, so we take L skew tensor, skew Pontryagin product, A dual tensor alpha, and now we put the ML tensor L here. So in other words, we can exchange one of the factors in this Pontryagin product with this line bundle here. Now, this is very good because, so again, as, uh, as, so as I said, we kind of can under, we kind of by induction kind of say we know what, anything we want to know about cohomology of twists of ML tensor L itself. So this we have a hope of controlling, but now of course the problem is that this is some big vector bundle. But again, if you know the fourier mukai story, if you take the Fourier transform of a line bundle, you can pull up by an isogeny, it becomes a direct sum of line bundles. So let's say, and this, this you can control by pulling up by a suitable isogeny. So it can control uh, by pulling back by a nice suitable isogeny. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say. So maybe that it wasn't very uh, satisfying. But w l let me just sort of summarize what the idea is. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a completely soft theorem, right? But so you, um, you first of all. Uh, I mean, the way you, you first of all take the vanishing of these, the syzygy question, you first of all turn it into a multipli problem about multiplication of global sections. But whereas the syzygy involves a P plus one fold tensor product of these M's, your multiplication involves a P fold tensor product. Then you use these kind of free, this Pontryagin idea to turn that into a global generation statement. Then you uh, use Kemp's criterion to treat that as a vanishing, and then you do this business, and you've kind of reduced the case by one. So it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a non-trivial, a non-trivial argument. But that's basically the, I, the idea. So let me just mention quickly a couple of later developments, and then maybe we can take an early break and go back and talk about curves, which is a little bit uh, softer and more geometric. So, um, but th I think this is a very nice theorem because it really, as I say, I mean, it puts the final. It, kind of brings to a very satisfactory conclusion of this classical theorem starting with Mumford and Kemp and so on. Okay. So um, Okay, so what are some developments that came out of this? So this is maybe a, the Pryashki's theorem maybe came out maybe 20, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, but there have been various developments. So the most interesting is this, uh, so this was kind of the starting point of this work by Pope, uh, I guess it's Pryashki and Pope, but well, Pryashki. So they sort of took the ideas in this proof and they kind of systematized them and they developed this theory, so they systematized, systematized these ideas and developed this theory of uh, what they call M regularity. So that's, uh, M here stands for Mukai, I think, not these M bundles. So M regularity is the kind of analog on brilliant varieties of Casanova Mumford regularity on projective space. And so they, uh, developed a very nice kind of uh, theory about it. They used it to study many questions. For example, what are the equations defining curves in their Jacobi? And there are some very interesting conjectures, like 
they have the point that like curves and the curve in its Jacobian somehow is supposed to be very analogous to rational curves of minimal degree and so on. So it's a very nice story. Um, let's see. Now you can. There are a couple other uh, syzygy questions you can ask. So the way these theorems work, they always work for multiples of an ample line bundle. I mean that's how the classical uh, Lefschetz Mumford Kemp theorems work. But you can ask if you have a line bundle on a Boolean variety that's not a multiple of some other, that's a primitive, a primitive polarization, what can you say about the syzygy? So there's uh, kind of a much softer uh, result there. So let me just, uh, so um, it turns out that for any line bundle, so in effect you would be looking at a, a polarization that's, that's primitive, this is when it's interesting, uh, that there's a statement involving local positivity and higher uh, syzygy. So, you start with uh, X and L, uh, any polarization, any ample line bundle on the Boolean variety. But so you shouldn't think of it as a multiple. You should think of it as like having type 1, 1, 1, something else. So, and what you ask is that what's called the Sashadri constant be large. So I'm not going to really define this, but let me just say, so this is the, so let's let uh, the, this be the Sashadri constant of L. at any point. So this is a measure of local positivity. I mean, you kind of blow up a point and you look at how much, well, it, it measures how many, if you take multiples of L, it measures asymptotically how many uh, sections, uh, how many jets that satisfies. And one way you can, there's a bound, this has a kind of a metric interpretation, and this is at least equal to pi over four times the minimal squared length of a period. This is the so-called boozer sarnak invariant of a period of L with respect uh, of the abelian variety with respect to the Hermitian form determined by L. So in any event, it's some interesting and measure of local positivity. And so the theorem is that if, um, so the little remark is that if K is less than or equal to, uh, I guess, epsilon over N minus 2, then this satisfies then L satisfies. So there's a kind of a statement like this. But this is, so for example, if I, f I forget how the numbers work out, but it's known that on a general abelian variety, epsilon is at least something like the square root on, on the order of the, uh, it's on the order of, um, basically it's like g, it's on the order of g, I think. And so you get some kind of statement like this. But it's not, this isn't terribly sharp. I mean, their theorem there is really optimal. Um, and then this story was then, let me just remark, was uh, generalized by Huang and To. So they proved analogous statements on a complex hyperbolic ma manifold. So they proved sort of analogs of this kind of statements on complex hyperbolic manifolds. So uh, uh, for pluricanonical for syzygies of, you know, pluricanonical things. And the, the analog of, the, um, of this, this thing here is basically an injectivity radius. So they're kind of statements like this. But I don't think these things are really expected to be uh, terribly, terribly sharp. Okay, so um, I, this ends my <laughs> discussion of the abelian varieties. So maybe we can take an early break now. So Vlad, you said that's okay? Okay, and then what we can do is sort of recover from all this uh, grungy cohomology. And then afterwards, I want to talk about, the, go back to curves and talk about the behavior of large degree embeddings of curves and the kind of the fine behavior. So I'll, that's kind of, uh, so that's what we'll do after the break. Okay, so why don't we have our break now? I think I did, let's see. Yeah, it's on, okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, change gears. This, this is kind of a romp in the park and talk about uh, asymptotic syzygies of curves. Okay, so. So basically I want to look at the, uh, and then I'll mention at the end the famous conjectures on canonical curves. So I want to, the, the, the theme is to look at the fine structure of syzygies of curves of, uh, embedded by large degree linear series. So, C will be a smooth projective curve of genus G. 
and let's let L sub D be a line bundle on C of degree D, and let's make it non split say 2G plus 1, but it's gonna, we're going to let D get very large. And so it defines some embedding, again, C into some P of R of D, which is, in this case, P of D minus G. So that's how many sections it has. Okay, and then what we'd like to do is we, we, so we discussed last time Green's theorem on that the first certain number of ste steps of the resolution have linear cis G. So now we want to kind of understand the, the fine structure of the which cis G groups vanish and don't vanish, where we let D get very large. And the interesting thing is we're going to start seeing the intrinsic geometry of C coming into the picture. Now, um, it's actually going to be useful to look at a more general question. So this, I think, maybe came up briefly last time. So instead of just looking at um, uh, so more generally, so remember, the way we set this up last time is we looked at this graded ring associated to L, but we never worried about its ring structure. We just thought it was a module. So we may as well look at more general modules. So more generally, uh, and this is, it's kind of really, I think it's conceptually very important to, uh, to decouple the module from the, so let's fix B any old line bundle on C. And then we can look at, um, we can form a, it determines a graded module. So we look at R of B with respect to L. For the moment, let me just call it L. I don't care at the moment what the degree is. So this will be the module, uh, so I take the sum over all M, conceivably I could have some, of H naught of B plus ML. So this isn't an algebra, but it, certainly it's a graded module. Uh, it's a graded module, module over the symmetric algebra, uh, over S, the symmetric algebra of H of L. So it's a uh, H of L. So it's a graded module over the homogeneous coordinate ring of the embedding projective space. And so again, we can look at its syzygy. So uh, can study at syzygy. So we can form a, so we have, we can form a, uh, uh, I'm going to, so, okay, so we have a certain number of generators. Now, now we don't get, we may not, we don't get a canonical generator in degree zero, but we just do the same thing as before, and so on. So we can look at generators of this module and relations and so on. Again, I'll call this E0, so the, again, I'm just looking at the minimal graded free resolution, so I just mean that the entries of the matrices should, should not have any non-zero constants. And again, we can define kind of multiplicity modules, KPQ. So we have, just as before, we have these uh, KPQ of uh, B with respect to L. Uh, and so remember, this is a finite dimensional vector space. So these are the number of degree P plus Q generators of the pth module of syzygies. And the way the numbers work is that EP then is the direct sum over Q of these uh, uh, KPQ of BL tensor S minus P minus Q. So it's just the same as before. And notice that there is an asymmetry here. So L is kind of giving us the algebra structure, and B is just occurring once. It's just a module. So these are B and L don't play symmetric roles. And just as I, uh, before, we can compute these KPQs as the cohomology of a Kuzul type complex. So let me just write this down. And KPQ is the cohomology of a Kuzul type complex. So you just have to throw in a B. So the middle term is uh, wedge P H naught of L tensor H naught of what? B plus Q L. And then, um, uh, well, maybe I'll go diagonally. So this gum goes to uh, wedge P minus 1 H naught of L. So again, I peel off an L and throw it in here. is a plus, and then this receives a map from uh, wedge P plus 1, H naught of L, tensor H naught of B plus Q minus 1 L. 
Okay, so the cohomology of this thing is these KPQs. So it's no essential difference. In the old case, uh, which is still the most important, but as you'll see, it's important. I think it's useful to. So the previous case, uh, the one we looked at before, is when B is just OC. B is trivial. So the one thing that happens is that when B is OC, then uh, basically these resolutions tell you about the resolutions of the ideal, homogeneous ideal of C. These don't carry any such completely obvious meaning. They are what they are. Okay, so, um, so what's the question we want to ask? So the question we want to ask is, uh, and this is still the most interesting case, but you'll see it's going to be important to have it. So um, the question we want to ask is for fixed B, so we fix uh, B and we let L get very positive. So for fixed B, um, when are these, because uh, uh, when is KPQ of B with respect to LD zero or non-zero, so when is this non-zero for very large D? Okay, so we want to fix a line bundle B and we want to study its syzygies, so to speak, with respect to an extremely sort of asymptotic behavior, if you like, of the syzygies with respect to an extremely positive uh, line bundle L. So we embed the curve very positively, and then we ask in that embedding, how, how do the syzygies of B look? And again, the most important cases are B equals trivial, but of course, we're also going to look at B equals canonical. That's also going to be important. And again, you can form, I'm going to draw some pictures in a minute. You can, um, you can write down these Betty diagrams, which are always. OK, so uh, let me start by stating it. So <coughs> theorem, and this is essentially Green's theorem, again. Uh, so theorem, uh, well, they, they, I mean, it, it combines, you know, stuff that various people do. But the essential thing is, is green. Okay. So um, I want to, the, the picture is that there are some syzygies that are always completely under control. So the theorem is we fix, we'll fix this B. And then for sufficiently large D, uh, so here's what happens. So first of all, we can always completely control the weight zero syzygies of B. That's to say the generators of this, the, the degree zero generators, the weight zero uh, relations. So the first statement is that K P zero of B L D, this is non-zero uh, if and only if uh, zero is less than or equal to P is less than or equal to R of B. So RB is the number of sections minus 1. So these are the degree, the weight 0 syzygies. The second statement, which is again just coming out of Casanova Mumford regularity, is that we never get syzygies of weight uh, 3 or higher. So uh, 0 for all for Q bigger than 2. Well, so you never get. Uh, weight 3 syzygies, so you can only have weight 0, 1, and 2. And then the third statement, which is the most interesting one, is we can completely control the weight 2 syzygies. So the statement is that Kp2 of B with respect to LD is non-zero, if and only if what? OK, so let me, it's slightly. I mean, I'm going to illustrate it. So Rd minus 1 minus R of Kx minus B is uh, well, less than or equal to P is less than or equal to R sub D minus 1. So again, we have weight 0 syzygies, weight 1 syzygies, and weight 2 syzygies. 
and they weight zero syzygies, and they weight two syzygies who are always completely controlled. And the number of weight zero syzygies we get is just the projective dimension of B. And the number of weight two syzygies we get, we get um, H naught of Kx minus B different groups. And they kind of, um, okay. so, Well, I mean, the interesting case is really when B is O, as you'll see. So then we're looking at the syzygies, but you'll, you'll see why we're doing this. I mean, if, the G, if you take a random B, there's not so much geometry. But the interesting case is of O, but then we also need K. <laughs> so you might as well throw in the B. I mean, I think, and it's conceptually important to separate the B from the L, I think. So. I was just wondering, when you ask this question, what does it mean? I mean, because when B is zero, right. O, then right. Then right. 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 So it is what it is. I mean, you know, of course, if you take a random B, it's not going to necessarily be very interesting. But uh, you'll see, it's important to. So I'm mainly interested in the case B equal O, but that, as you'll see in a minute, involves B equals K. So you might as well throw it in. Okay. So let's let's see. These numbers are confusing. So let's let's work out what this says in the case of uh, B equals trivial. So, okay. So let's see what this says when B equals O C. Okay. So remember, we have these, uh, we have these uh, Betty diagrams. So remember, we draw this uh, P is here, Q is here, and we're going to draw the dimensions of these various, we'll imagine drawing which of these uh, KPQs are non-zero. So we go from zero to, I'm going to, let's see, I think I want, well, R minus G is going to come in, and then I want an R minus 1. And R minus G is what? Is D minus 2, well, it's going to come in. Okay, and R minus 1 as well. Well, it's D minus 2 as well. Okay, so let's see what this says. <laughs> okay, so we never get weight sy syzygies of weight 2 or higher, so I didn't draw a weight. Okay. Now, what this says, which isn't surprising, so the KP0 are just the degree 0 generators. So in this case, remember that this R is just this, is just this ring R of L, H of ML. So obviously, we get one generator in degree 0. So we're going to get well, one thing here. But I'll just put star will be non-zero. So in this case, it means one, but we don't really care. And so we get one generator in, um, in, in weight zero. That's just the constant function. And we know that this thing is projectively normal. So that's not guaranteed. But we'll put, we know that um, for large degree embedding of a curve, it's projectively normal. So we, we only need one generator there. OK. So and then this will mean is zero. OK. And then, uh, since, of course, B has one section, so R is 0. So, I mean, this is obvious here in this case. So we don't get any other, there are no other generators in weight 0. OK. Now, what about these KP tubes, the highest weight generators? OK. So, these, so uh, the resolution ends, in this case, in R minus 1. And what this says is that provided that the degree is very large, this is the statement where we need the degree is very large, um, there are exactly Z, uh, G values of P, right, because this is uh, G minus 1. So there are exactly G values of P where we get some syzygies of weight 2. And they occur at the end of the resolution. So what the statement, uh, uh, what the last statement says is that there are exactly G values, so there are G numbers here, where I get syzygies of weight 2. And I don't get any other syzygies of weight 2. So there's nothing else here. OK, so that's what the general theorem says. So the theorem doesn't say a priori anything about syzygies of weight 1. But, um, but, um, but there's something we can see, which is, so what this theorem, can, what the, what the theorem controls is it, I mean, and so it gives us complete control over the sort of top and bottom row here. But now, you know, if we, we have to have some syzygies here, right? There has to be some syzygies here. They can't be of degree zero, weight zero. They can't be of weight two. So they must be of weight one. So this is Green's theorem. So the corollary of this uh, is that if, um, so this is Green's theorem, if, um, if P, so in this range here, from here to here, we must be getting um, syzygies entirely of weight 1, because they're not, everything else, is, we know, doesn't occur. So if, um, if uh, P is in this 
between 1 and r minus g minus 1, which is whatever it is, then only P, kp1 can occur. Occur just because we rule out everything else, i.e., in this range here, EP has to be just the direct sum of S minus P minus 1s. So what must be happening is we must be getting non-zero stuff here. And so this is Green's theorem. So in, the, in this way, I mean, this is, I mean, this is what? This is D minus 2G minus 1. So this is Green's theorem. In this range here, there we, we get syzygies of only one degree. So this is uh, this property ends of this thing holds. So this is Green's theorem. And this is actually how he proved his theorem. He proved it. Okay. So, okay. So this statement uh, recovers Green's theorem, but it doesn't completely answer the question of which can occur. Because, so this is, so far what we know, I mean, this is forced on us, so we get, but what we don't know is how long these syzygies of weight one last. So there's no conclusion about what happens for these weight one syzygies once you're past the point where the weight two syzygies start. So the, uh, let's see, I'll put it down here if you don't mind. So uh, the question, uh, let me try to make this as a great blackboard. But then the question that this leaves unanswered, which is the, so question one, is, uh, is, uh, is what? So when is KP1 non-zero in, sort of, in this sort of mystery range for, um, for uh, D minus 2G less than or equal to P? less than or equal to uh, d minus g minus 1. So we don't know. I mean, so again, this is the resolution of the homogeneous ideal. We, we know for sure that we start getting these weight 2 syzygies, but we don't know how long the weight 1 syzygies last for. For example, do we expect, is it going to be true that there is some range of p's for which we get syzygies simultaneously of two different weights? I mean, the answer will be yes. It's yes. OK. So that's, uh, OK. So let's do the next interesting case uh, where B is a canonical bundle. So let's do the canonical bundle. Let's see what this says. Okay, so again, let me draw the table. Uh, okay, so let's see. So here's P, here's Q. Again, we're going to only get stuff. Uh, here, I want to go up to G minus 1. And then I'm going to go up to D minus, uh, R minus 1, which is D minus G minus 1. OK. So what does this say if I take B equal canonical bundle? Well, OK. So R of the canonical bundle, the projective dimension of the canonical bundle is G minus 1. So what this says is that uh, the KP0 is non-zero if and only if uh, P is between 0 and uh, G minus 1. So that says that I get generators of degree 0. Those are just sections of, um, uh, let, me assume, let me assume that the genus is at least 1. I mean, we don't need to worry about rational removal curve. So uh, I get, actually, let me assume the genus is at least 2. Yeah, okay. So, okay, so I get, I definitely get non-zero. I have, these are sections of the canonical bundle. Then this is the kernel. These are things that are generators of the kernel of H0 of K tensor H0 of L mapping onto H0 of K tensor L and so on. And then what I say is I know I don't get anything there. Um, OK, what about the KP2? Well, let's see. Uh, so uh, let's see. So B is canonical. 
if I get R sub D minus 1, and what is R of, um, of K minus D? Well, K minus D is O, so R of D has projected dimension 0. So there's only one value uh, for which this is non-zero, which is the last one. So this is zero, non-zero, if and only if P equals R sub D, uh, uh, D minus G minus 1. So that's R minus 1. So here, I get one thing over here, and I get nothing else in the bottom row. So remember, dash means, uh, means 0. OK, now, if you compare these two pictures, so look at the top row. And yeah, so let me just point out that there are G things here, right? There are G of these things here. So there's a, there's a symmetry here. You see, this picture is the reflection of that picture. And that reflects there's a duality. There's serial duality going on. So these pictures are reflections of each. Well, yeah, let me say that in a minute. But, so what about the KP1s? So, um, so the KP1s, so it's the same story as before. The theorem doesn't a priori tell us anything about weight 1 syzygies, but we can infer some stuff about weight 1 syzygies just because at each stage we need to get some weight 1 syzygies. So uh, this, we deduce here that uh, Kp1 of Kc with respect to L is non-zero for uh, P between G and d minus g minus 2. So we have to get stuff when there's nothing else in the, so we have to get stuff here. And uh, well, what we don't know is, um, this is actually not going to be a problem, but what we don't know is when they exist here. So the question is, um, so the question here is, uh, so let's call this question 1 prime is uh, uh, when is Kp1 of the canonical bundle with respect to Ld non-zero when d is very large uh, for in this mystery range. So for 0 less than or equal to p, less than or equal to g minus 1, and d very large. So that's the thing that's not governed by what we've written down. Right, and as I said, uh, there's some duality here. So you see, the point is that uh, there's a, this picture is dual to that picture. So, uh, so duality, so let me just state it for general. There's some ser duality here. So it says that um, KPQ of B with respect to LD is dual to, well, let me, do you want me to, uh, maybe I won't write down the numbers. Well, okay, I'll write it down. K R minus 1 minus, the numbers don't matter, but maybe, of course, they matter if you're being 2 minus Q, K minus B, LD for uh, large D. So these are dual. And so, but the duality is just what you see in the picture. This thing is dual to that thing. These guys are dual to the middle row there and so on. So just look at the picture. <laughs> okay. So what this means, so duality implies, so, so what duality says, uh, is that question one is equivalent to question two. So if we want to understand uh, question one prime, if we want to understand the fine behavior of these things, knowing when the KP1 of the ideal sheet, the homogeneous ideal is not zero, is the same thing as knowing when these other KP1s of the canonical bundle are not zero. I mean, there's some confusing shift of indices, but it's the same question. And you can um, ask the same question for other B. I mean, again, the Geometric meaning isn't so clear, but what, what you find if you apply this theorem is that there, the, again, the situation for weight zero syzygies and weight two syzygies is always under complete control. And so what you find for an arbitrary B is that there's some region where you know that weight one syzygies must occur because nothing else is there, and then there's some ambiguous region. And the interesting question is what happens in the ambiguous region. Okay, so I want to sort of look at these questions. and. Um, I want to, the, again, the interesting, in some sense, if you're interested in equa defining equations, it's kind of question one that's natural because you're looking at the syzygies of the ideal, but it's question two that we're going to want to answer. That's the more geometric one to work with. Okay, so let's, uh, question one prime. So let's go back to this question one prime. So when do we have syzygies of the, when do we have funny syzygies of the, uh,
of the canonical bundle. Okay, so let's see. Um, so actually, this uh, Mark Green had actually already looked at this a little bit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look at these. So let's return to these. Uh, so let's look at so return. So we'll focus on on these KP. Well, so these are the ones I want to look at. Okay. So Mark Green had actually looked at these in his original paper. So uh, what he showed, what he observed, is that. Uh, so first of all, K01 of KC, well, let me just write, K01 is always 0. And what this means concretely is this means, i.e., the maps from H0 of K. So these are generators of this module, tensor H0 of L, that this surjects for very positive L onto H0 of K plus L, and similarly for multiples of L. So that's what it means to say you only get, you get generators of this module because they come here. But once you have generators, the other higher sections you get by multiplication by L. So this is basically just the statement that the canonical divisor is base point free. But what's already more interesting is he showed that if you look at the syzygies of the, the relations among these things, uh, let me write K11 of KC uh, LD. These sometimes are zero, and they're sometimes non-zero. And they're non-zero if and only if the curve is hyperelliptic. So you start to see kind of intrinsic geometry of C. So you can tell whether curve is hyperelliptic by whether the kind of module relations here is generated by in degree, well, the right degree or not. OK. So now this, uh, what happens if you look at the higher KP1s? So there's a kind of an elementary remark here, which is that there's an elementary. So the way these things work when you try to kind of combine, compare the syzygies to geometry is that there's always one direction that's easy. So uh, um, if you have a funny curve, you can see that you're going to be forced to get a funny syzygy. So what's elementary is that if, uh, if uh, you can express C as a branch covering of P1 with relatively low degree of degree less than or equal to p plus 1, then uh, kp1 of kc ld is non-zero. So if p is equal to 1, this is this that if the curve is hyperelliptic, then you must get a funny syzygy there. And if k curve is trigonal, which is it has a 3 to 1 covering, then you get a second next syzygy and so on. And incidentally, this says that the uh, um, this says that there's always at least g over two places where you get non-zero syzygies in both rows. So the resolutions of curves are never pure, because you know it's well known that a curve of genus g is a branch covering of p1 with gene, a degree at most like g over two, give or take a little bit. So you always get at least g over two places where you get syzygies of two degrees. So these things are never pure. Okay, so this is elementary, and so this led to the conjecture. So I'll say a little bit more about the background of this. But then the natural conjecture was that uh, this should be if and only if. So KP1 of uh, KCLD it is uh, non-zero uh, if and only if this holds. So the least degree with which you can express a covering of uh, curve as a covering of P1 is called the ganality. So this means that the ganality of C is in most P plus 1. So I'll say a little bit more in a minute. This story here is that the most famous, I'm sort of talking and being in a slightly kind of ahis ahistorical development here. So let me just say a word. The most famous conjecture which is about these syzygies of curves, which Green's conjecture on syzygies of canonical curves. And the idea, his beautiful idea was that you should be able to, you can read off, you can tell kind of some, well, I mean, it's almost tautologous that if you take a canonical curve, you embed a curve by a canonical linear series, it's almost tautologous 
that its syzygies reflect intrinsic geometry because it's the canonical embedding. But he had a very beautiful conjecture, which I'll state at the end, about, um, about um, exactly what, I mean, this what invariant exactly determines the syzygies of canonical curves. And that's still not known. But if you, this, this was supposed to be a kind of a little brother of that conjecture. So it, uh, you're supposed to, for, for various, I mean, some ways of setting it up, it looks kind of similar, but it's going to be, it was always supposed to be easier because you, um, you're just looking for ganality and you get to take L very positive. Um, and so, as you, as I'll say later, so the essential product, uh, 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 progress for canonical curves is due to Claire Voisin, and she and Apredu then uh, applied these ideas to study, this came to be known as the ganality conjecture, this ganality conjecture, and they proved it, for example, so proof for general curves, this ganality projected they proved for general curves, and uh, let's say of each ganality. So it was known uh, for many general curves. Okay. So anyway, it was always kind of understood that this was supposed to be easier than the conjecture for canonical curves. But I think it, the surprising thing <laughs> turned out to be almost, almost. Uh, not quite trivial, but I mean, really, turned, it's surprising how easy it is. So I want to now, I'm going to explain this. So now let me state the, the general theorem here that will imply this. So this is theorem one with ein. OK, so and again, I think I'll state it for an arbitrary b. But um, again, this is going to be the most important case. So um, uh, so let's fix a, a line bundle b on c. So remember, again, I didn't really work this out for an arbitrary b. But always the question on curves is which of these syzygies, the question is always which syzygies of weight 1 occur. Everything else is governed by this theorem. And then the theorem is that, so we fix a line bundle b and some p grain equal to 0. And then, um, OK, so let me keep them in suspense one second more while I erase. Um, and so there's a complete understanding of when these kp1s are, are non-zero for large degree, so let's see what the answer is. Again, there's an elementary obstruction to there being zero, and then the theorem is that that's the only thing that happens. So, uh, Um, okay, so the theorem is, uh, what is the theorem? So the theorem is that um, uh, the KP1, um, so then KP1 of B with respect to LD is 0 for large D, if and only if. So uh, the condition is this. If you take any divisor of degree P plus 1 on the curve, that should impose independent conditions on sections of B. So for all divisors C, all effective divisors, all effective divisors C of degree P plus 1 on the curve, uh, they should impose independent conditions on sections of B. So the map from sections of B to evaluate them at the points of C, that should be subjective. And so this happens if and only if these KP. Now, what, of course, what's elementary is, which way is elementary? What's elementary is if this fails and this fails. So I guess this direction, so this direction is, ele is, is kind of elementary. So it's, um, OK. So, um, OK, so what is, let's apply this to the, um, so let's apply this to the canonical bundle. So let's take uh, B equals the canonical bundle of C. 
So how can you have a divisor of degree p plus 1 that fails to impose independent conditions on the canonical series? Well, you know, that means you look at the, you embed the curve in canonical space, and you look at this divisor of degree p plus 1, and it spans a linear space of dimension less than p. And then it's well known that that means that it moves in a non-trivial linear series. So uh, this, this means that, uh, so to say, so this is the, I mean, this gives this canality conjecture. So this says that if, uh, if kp1, so if, if there is no such, if there's no linear series of, if, uh, um, uh, um, right, so if, if there's no such linear series, then this thing is zero for all sufficiently large d. So if, um, uh, or to say it differently, if kp1 of kc with respect to ld is non-zero for some, for d sufficiently large, it, it's independent of, uh, uh, then there exists, then there exists, then there exists uh, g1, you know, a c to a g1 p plus 1 of degree less than or equal to a g1 p plus 1 on the curve. Right, because you take this, that, I mean, if this is non-zero, then there must be a divisor of degree p plus 1 that imposes, fails to impose independent conditions on the canonical bundle, and that's no, well known. Okay, so this is the, and there's actually, let's see, well, let me just, this is sometimes called p, this condition is sometimes called p very ample. If, um, okay. okay. Um, so by duality, this says that we can exactly read off this is the, so this says we can exactly read off, uh, this gives the complete picture, so by duality, so let me just, I hope I have my numbers right, then this gives the complete picture of the, of the grading, of the grading of the resolution of the homogeneous ideal. So let me just draw you the, let me just draw you the picture here. So remember what the picture was. So now I'm going back to the case b equals 0, but I'm just going to. So the picture was, so here we have 0, 1, 2. And in our p thing, we have 0 to r minus g, if I have my numbers right. Then we go to r minus 1. So the story was we always had one generator here, nothing there. We get g places down here where we definitely get generators and nothing else. And then the question was, where do you get these weight 1 syzygies? So what we knew before is that they, they, we have to have weight 1 syzygies in this region here because there are no other syzygies. And the question is, how long do they last? And then what the theorem says then, at least the last time you get a syzygy of weight 1 here, if I've got it right, is r minus the ganality of c. Yeah, so this, this, yeah, right. So this was a conjecture, now it's a theorem, right. So this is the ganality thing. So they proved it for general curves. But your proof has nothing to do with theirs. No. Well, it's related to Claire's thing, as you'll see. But yeah, I mean, it turns out that the problem is almost, <laughs> is completely elementary, if you think about it right. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing for everybody, as you'll see. But it's fun, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's, it's not, it's right. So this is, the theorem is that this ganality conjecture is true. And I will show you the proof. This is a romp in the park, as you'll see. So, right. And so this is the theorem. So it's true for all curves, right? Okay. So now, um, hmm. okay. So uh, supposing this can be, we, there's a little bit more than one can say. Supposing this condition fails. So for example, supposing we're before, you know, we have, so, you know, we, we're here and we're, we're in a situation where we know there are non-zero syzygies. So then, um, um, uh, then there's a, also the proof will give us slightly, we can say something about the rate of growth of the KP1s. Uh, let me just think, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm not going to state theorem 2, so I'll let you state theorem 2 for yourself. So anyway, you can also, so for, so uh, you can also control sort of, uh, uh, let me just say you can also control, you can also control the rate of growth of growth of the others of, you know, KP1, B, B with respect to LD, 
uh, when you're below the range where the theorem applies. So the theorem says that if this P, if these B is P very ample, you get some vanishing, but you can also control the geometrically, there's a geometric computation of the rate of growth. Okay. So, um, okay, so what's the idea here is to look at this on symmetric products. So here the history gets a little bit, okay, so let me, um, I mean, it's new, so I don't know. <laughs> This, this fall. Excuse me? No, but you'll see. I mean, I'll give you the complete proof. It really, you'll see the problem is, uh, <laughs> uh, it's really elementary. Yeah, okay. Okay, so. There's also, let me say, there's, a th there's an effective statement about how large D has to be, but it's really a kind of a silly statement at the moment. So one would like to get a better statement. But. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, so let's talk about now Kazuo cohomology and symmetric products. So um, in some sense, it's been understood for a while that you can see syzygies and symmetric products. I mean, I noticed that you could see uh, syzygies of canonical curves and you know, higher cohomology of the Abel-Jacobi map, but nothing that was kind of a useless thing. But um, the background is that, so as I'll, as I'll say in a minute, the most, you know, the famous, as I say, I'm doing this a historically. The really famous conjecture is the conjecture for canonical curves, which Claire proved. I mean, the big theorem is her proof for general canonical curves. So she wanted to compute the syzygies of general canonical curves. And so general in this case means that it's kind of general with respect to you know, what linear series are on the curve. So where do you find a general canonical curve? Where it's known you should find those on a K3 surface. So the natural idea is if you want to study syzygies of general canonical curves, you should study syzygies of K3 surfaces, because then the hyperplane section. And uh, so she kind of uh, uh, did this very successfully. So let me just say she used Hilbert schemes of a K3 surface to study uh, uh, syzygies of general canonical curves. And I'll state that, you know, I'll state, uh, so that's her big theorem. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, there are two points. So you sort of set it up as a syzygy, as a sort of question about Hilbert schemes of K3s, and then you compute for 40 pages. There's only Claire could do. And so uh, our remark is that if you use a slight variant of this, so she, it, it gets a little bit technical, but she worked with line bundles and she looked at the restriction of the line bundles from the K3 cross hill to the, to the, um, to the universal family. But, and then so, so, so somehow if you, if you pass down to the Hilbert, she wasn't actually working on the Hilbert scheme itself. She was working on something over it. But our remark is that if you pass down to the Hilbert scheme itself, or in our case, the symmetric product, the whole thing becomes, you get a vector bundle, not line bundles, but, um, but you can kind of see the geometry. So here we'll use a variant. So let me, so again, I'll explain the variant. So of course, if you're on a curve, you're working on symmetric products, not Hilbert schemes. Okay, but so let, what's the idea here? So now let's fix a line bundle B and an integer P. And so what we want to show, what we want to show, yeah. Ah, I'm going to prove the theorem, right. We want to show that if, but I want to, I mean, I mean, the idea, I mean, <laughs> it's really a small variant of, you know, of her thing. It's a little bit, it's a strange situation. But anyway, so if, um, they want to show that if B is this sort of P very ample. So in other words, uh, I mean, this is the serious direction. That if this, if, uh, it's gone now, but if any divisor of degree P plus one imposes independent conditions, then, um, then, uh, so this is the thing we need to show. And then we get a vanishing of these, uh, well, B, I'll use the B. It doesn't, uh, for D is very large. So this is the important, I mean, there's also a non-vanishing statement, but that's much more elementary. Okay, so now let's consider, uh, how am I doing for time? Okay, so let's consider, uh, 
the p plus first, all this stuff takes place on the p plus first symmetric product. So cp plus 1 will be the p plus first uh, symmetric product. I mean, of course, that's also a Hilbert scheme, but I mean, why? Okay. And now, um, let's see. And so we're going to compute on that. Now, it's kind of it's well known that if we take a line bundle uh, B on the curve, that determines on the symmetric product, or on a Hilbert scheme, but in this case on a symmetric product, it determines a tautological vector bundle of rank P plus 1. So this determines a vector bundle, which I'll call E B or E P plus 1 B of rank P plus 1. Uh, on, on C P plus one, and it's something. Well, and what its property is, it's the fiber. So a point on C P plus one is the divisor of degree P plus one, and so the fiber of this thing, fiber of E B, at a divisor of C, is just the vector space H naught of B tensor O C. So for each C, you get a rank P plus one vector space, namely the sections of B on this zero-dimensional scheme, and they fit together to form a vector bundle, and it's called, I'll call it EB. Sometimes, uh, in the literature, it's sometimes called, I don't like this notation. People sometimes use this notation, but I don't. Anyway, so it's a, and you know, I'm, let's see, do I want to, is there any good reason to write that? You, you, you know, write down the universal family over the symmetric product, and you take a, take a, you know, pu push down a vector bundle, pu push down from that. Oh, maybe I'll write down the definition. No, maybe I won't. No, maybe I won't. OK. So you're just, I mean, there's only one thing you could do to write that down. OK. So and so the, the point is that compared to what I mean, is that this is kind of the push for, see, Claire didn't actually work on the Hilbert scheme itself. She worked on the universal family. So this is basically the push down of which she was looking at. So and you'll see what the advantage of pushing down is. Oh, OK, very good. So these are actually quite interesting vector bundles. And of course, they exist on any Hilbert scheme, but we're just in the one dimensional case. OK, so uh, now uh, there's an evaluation map. So if you so have an evaluation map, so we can take, uh, well, we can take a section of D and, uh, well, let me, well, we can take a section of B and we can evaluate it. I mean, for each C, <laughs> we can, so we can take a section of B and we can evaluate it at, at C. So what that means is that the trivial vector bundle whose fibers are H naught of B uh, maps onto our vector bundle E sub B. Because E sub B is the bundle whose fiber at C is this vector space. So, so this means we get this means we get an evaluation map of vector bundles. So H naught of B tensor over C. So these are the the symmetric, the trivial vector bundle and symmetric product, this maps onto E sub B. Okay. And what does it mean? So this is the advantage of working these vector bundles. What does it mean to say that any divisor of degree P plus 1 imposes independent conditions on, on um, sections of B? That means that this map is surjective. So, uh, so almost tautologically, B satisfies this P very ample condition. Mm -hmm. So what do I want to call this? I'll call this EV. P very ample, uh, if and only if uh, this evaluation map is surjective as a map of vector bundles. OK. So the point is, of course, again, none of this is, is all very standard. So the point is now assuming that we, as we are, that uh, assuming as we are that this thing is P very ample, we now have a surjective vector bundle map. So so in our situation, we get a let me we get a surjective vector bundle map uh, to this onto this bundle E sub B. 
So it's a rank p plus one bundle. And so there's some kernel bundle, so which we will call m of p b plus one, uh, p plus one b. But let me just call it m. Well, okay, m p plus one. I mean, we're always on. This. So this is always taking place on the symmetric product. So we get some vector bundle like that. Yeah. No, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Um, um, okay. And now, so in, in just for what it's worth, this turns out to be, I mean, th this is an isomorphism global section. I mean, people have computed, people have computed these cohomology groups. Hmm. Okay, but now um, here's the next remark. Again, this is kind of if L is any line bundle on C, on, on C, right? So then we can, we can do the same construction with, uh, with B and L instead of C, and you can take determinants. So let's let, uh, let's let, Let's let n sub l be the determinant. So this is now a line bundle of this vector bundle E sub l. So this is a line bundle on uh, C p plus 1. So again, these have been well studied. OK. And um, uh, OK, and the, so the interesting thing is, so see, imagine, let, let's do this for you. See, what would you think the sections of this could be? Well, we have to take the determinant of this. So if this has rank. Whatever, if we take the p plus 1, if we take wedge p plus 1 of this, we get a map from wedge p plus 1 h naught of b to this n sub b. And it turns out that that's an isomorphism. So from a, uh, it turns out, I mean, again, I, maybe this is due to Ellingswood and Lane. I'm not sure exactly who it's due to. But again, it's quite well known. Is that h naught on c p plus 1 of this funny n sub l is exactly wedge p plus 1 h naught of L. OK. So let me give this sequence a name here. So OK, very good. I'm going to, let's see. Well, let me finish this, and then maybe I'll have to state Green's, Green's conjecture next time. Or maybe I'll leave it to you to look up. But anyway, let me just quickly finish this. We're coming close to the end. Uh, OK, so um, let's take that sequence there, the sequence star, and let's twist by this. Uh, by this n sub l, or n sub l d. OK, so what do we get? So we get some, well, here we get h naught of b, the trivial vector space times n sub l. And this uh, maps to what? This maps to this e sub b tensor n sub l. And in our situation, this is a surjective map of vector bundles. And coming in here, we have this m of p plus 1 d tensor n sub l. OK. And um, I think happened there. Well. OK. And um, so, the, so let's call this map u. Now, here's the interesting thing. What is the h naught of this bundle here? So the h naught of this thing here, by what we said, is h naught of b tensor wedge p plus 1 h naught of l. So this is one of the terms. This is the term, the incoming term in the Kazool complex computing KP1. So it's not, you know, it's not a huge surprise to imagine that this bundle, the H naught of this bundle, has some Kazoolish meaning. And what the lemma is, and this is basically Claire's computation. So basically, the lemma here. I mean, again, she wasn't actually working with these bundles, but um, it's really the computation there. Is that what this bundle is? Is it's the it's the bundle of um, Kazool KP. Uh, it's the bundle of Kazool. The H naught of this bundle here is the space of Kazool cycles. So it's Z P one 
of B with respect to L. So this is this group of cycles that compute the KP1s. And the image, and this is just the, you know, the Kazool map here. So what does it mean? So these are cycles, these are boundaries. <laughs> what does it mean to say that KP1 is zero? So what this means is that uh, KP1 of uh, B, uh, yeah, with respect to L sub D is zero if and only if this map uh, is surjective. This map from H naught of, you know, B tensor H naught of NL D uh, surjects onto this H naught of EB tensor NL. Or what's essentially equivalent is we need to show that this H1 vanishes. Okay, so, you know, and then this is, I mean, again, in fact, for L of large degree, and this is implied by saying that the H1 of MB tensor these NLs should vanish uh, if L is, if D is sufficiently large. Okay. So, okay. But... <laughs> This is true for foolish. This is just Sarah vanishing. So that's the point. The point is that um, when D becomes very large, for each D, for each D, for each line bundle L, I get a line. For each L on the curve, I get a line bundle L on the on the symmetric product. And the point is that if L is very positive, these line bundles are getting positive, and Sarah vanishing applies. So this is just going to come down. That's kind of crazy, but it just comes down to Sarah vanishing. So then the point is that. Uh, 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 okay, so it just comes down to um, Okay, so then the, the theorem follows from the lemma that just it's just Sarah vanishing. So the lemma is just that. Um, the, so then the theorem follows from the lemma. So the lemma then is that uh, if uh, so the N L the N sub L satisfy Sarah vanishing. In other words, in other words, I e for any sheaf f on the coherent product, if f is any coherent sheaf on Cp plus 1, then, uh, then uh, Hi of f tensor NL, d, let's say, is 0 for I positive. Uh, so then let's say there exists a d0 of f such that is a, if, if D is sufficiently large. So, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of silly, but it comes down to Sarah vanishing, if you just want it in this asymptotic form. So that's it. Um, and you, then you can get an effective statement by looking a little bit harder, but at the, be not, I mean, the thing should be effective with D at least on the order of like G plus, I mean, on a few times G. I think the effective statement at the moment is like P squared times G or something like that. It's not very good at the moment. But anyway, so, um, right, and there's, I, you might ask, what, I mean, does the same thing hold on surfaces? And on surfaces, the situation gets a little bit hairier because this lemma isn't so obvious on, isn't obviously true on surfaces. There's some, there, what's happening on surfaces is you have Hilb and you have the symmetric product. And as the LD becomes more positive, what happens is that the N sub L's are getting, you're adding, you're getting, you're pulling back a more and more positive thing from the symmetric product. So you have to control the map to the, from the hill to the symmetric product. But what? This is almost because the, yeah. The point is the point is that I mean it's just look n sub l twisted by a divisor d. Uh, let me let me do a p. Is what this is is n. So if you're on a symmetric product and you take a, you know there's a, there's always a, a, a divisor on the curve gives you a divisor. So this is n sub l plus I don't know plus let me call it d sub p where this is the set of all C prime plus P. So, you know, there are these kind of standard, there are these standard hyperplane divide, I mean, they're standard ample things on a symmetric product. 
where you look at all divisors that contain p. So when you take l more, po if you add something to l, you're taking a given n sub l and you're adding just basically multiples of the ample. So it's. Well, but on, I mean, this, you have to be careful. So this, is, this makes perfectly good sense on curves. But on surfaces, dp, the problem is on surfaces, n lives on the Hilbert scheme, but d lives on the symmetric product. So what's happening in the case of surfaces is you're taking a fixed line bundle on the Hilbert scheme, and you're adding more and more positive pullback or very positive things from the symmetric product. So that's not, I mean, you have to control some direct images from Hilbert to Sim. I mean, it, I, I don't see any reason that it shouldn't be true, but it's not, it's not free. So what, what's happening is that the, in the case of surfaces, these guys live on the symmetric product, these guys live on hill. But in curves, they happen to be, <laughs> so it's completely solved. Okay, and I should, I'm out of time, but so I consider, my, consider me to have told you what Green's theorem on Kanana, everybody should go under, do you want me to quickly state Green? Maybe I'll do it at the beginning of next time, or should I? I don't know. Okay, let me get, I mean, I'll it'll take five minutes, three minutes, okay. I mean, okay. So this was the conjecture that really got things going. And this is, I mean, this was the first place that one saw, uh, that you saw, we're supposed to see geometry. So, uh, okay, so let me just do Green's conjecture on canonical curves, and then we'll, so again, I apologize. Okay, so. Let's take C, a curve of genus G, and maybe make it non-hyperelliptic. So here's the canonical embedding. OK. And um, so what are the classical theorems? So with the classical theorem, so Noether's theorem says if you're non-hyperelliptic, uh, 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 the canonical embedding is normally generated. C is projectively normal. And then the famous theorem of Petri is uh, that if, if C is not trigonal and not a plane quintic, C is not trigonal, actually this is wrong, if not, if C is not trigonal and not a plane quintic, then this is equivalent to uh, I mean, assuming that it's always or already non-hyperliptic, the homogeneous ideal <coughs> is generated by quadrics. Okay, so Green then had, I mean, once you, I mean, the, the question is then, when does the canonical curve satisfy this property n sub p or n sub k? And uh, what Green, so he had a very, I mean, um, we just have to kind of, extrapolate these two things. So what's, special, what's the same about trigonal curves and plane quintic? So a trigonal curve has a G13, and a plane quintic has a G25. And if you plug in those numbers into Clifford's theorem, so remember Clifford's theorem says that if you have a, you know, a special line bundle on a curve of degree D and it moves in the system of dimension R, then D minus 2R is non-negative. So the idea was to look at D minus 2R. So if you take a plane quintic, a, a, a trigonal curve, uh, you have a G13, three, so 3 minus 2 times 1 is 1. And if you have a plane quintic, that's it has a G25, five, and 5 minus 2 times 2 is also 1. So that was uh, Green's idea of how to, um, uh, OK. And so um, that's his conjecture. So let's just, so then there's just some definitions. So the Clifford index of a line bundle A on C is uh, a degree of A uh, minus 2 times R of A. R is the projective dimension, so that's the definition. And then one defines the Clifford index of the curve itself to be the minima of all the Clifford indices of A, but you want to restrict to, let's say, A such that it's shows, so H naught of A and H1 of A, or at least 2, let's say. Okay. So then Clifford index 0 by the, if and only if part of Clifford's theorem is hyperelliptic, Clifford index 1 is plane, is known to be trigonal or plane quintics. And so the conjecture, so Green's conjecture is, uh, is that uh, 
is what? The Clifford Index. So again, you can read off. The Clifford Index is the gadget that governs the grading of the canonical thing. So the Clifford Index of C is the least integer P such that NP fails for the canonical, for the canonical embedding. And again, one direction is elementary, that if you have a special linear series, then you can cook up, then you can see that NP fails. So the problem <coughs> is, to, is to go the other way, that if you don't have a special linear series, then NP holds, or what's the same thing, is if NP fails, then you should, you should given a funny syzygy, you should be able to cook up. Uh, and so, of course, the essential work here, the, you know, this is what I was saying about K3 surfaces, is Voisin, so she proved it for uh, general canonical curves and many other cases besides. But uh, you see, and again, the idea is this is where, so this is where the hilb of K3 comes in. Uh, you see, because uh, it's known, so you need to, I mean, how you get a general curve, so if this is going to be true, you need to take a curve that's general from the point of view of linear series. And it's known that if you take a K3 surface of Picard number one, then the hyperplane section, general hyperplane section is general with respect to, uh, linear series. And so, and then it's also known, it's elementary, that if the syzygies of the, I mean, the syzygies of a K3 are the same as the syzygies of the hyperplane section. So if you want to do, for general canonical curves, you should try to show that the Hilbert scheme of the K3 satisfies this. And that's what she did with, uh, she, again, she set it up with these, uh, you show that K3 satisfies this. So, I mean, what she did, I can tell you basically what she did, is you look at the universal family, so S cross Hilb of S, and again, it's, well, kp plus 1 of s. And so this is the universal family uh, hilb plus 1 of s. And then what she said is she said that the, this condition kp1 is you write down some lo suitable line bundle here, and the, the kp1 will hold if and only if the h naught here surjects onto the h naught there. And then she computed for 30 or 40 pages, and in the end was able to do it. And you see, what's the connection? This, uh, but the point is that the H naught here is basically the H naught of this vector bundle on the, on the. So the only point is, if you, she wasn't thinking about vector bundles on Hill, but if you think about that, then you can kind of see that. I mean, then you immediately see these special pencils and so on. So, OK, so that's, that's that. OK, so what I'm going to do in the last lecture is um, then the question is, so we, now we have a pretty good feeling about what's happening for curves, at least for large degree curves, you understand. And so then the question will be, if you look at a large degree embedding of a higher dimensional variety, what can you say? And so there I'll discuss the kind of asymptotic behavior of that and some conjectures there. Okay, so that's the plan.